respect what God is doing here in worship. So glad that we have this time together, whether you're with us online or in person today. Welcome. Oh, yeah, we can dismiss the kids now, too. Thanks, Rob, for reminding me. <laughs> All right. Children, you are dismissed for, for Children's Church. Go back out the door that way. There's Miss Amanda back there. All right, thank you. Well, in case you hadn't noticed, I'm not Pastor Dave. <laughs> uh, Dave and I talked um, Saturday morning. He called me and we talked about some stuff. And, you know, um, like we often do, we, we kind of complained to our pastor, right? All of our woes. And I was telling him how busy I am these days because I'm preparing for, to be gone for a month in, in Africa, uh, leaving February 4th, to be gone for a month. And I've got a lot of teaching, preaching responsibilities while I'm there. And so I was crying on Dave's shoulder about how busy I am. <laughs> he said, okay, I'll pray for you. I said, thank you, Dave. And then he calls me Saturday, yesterday, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It says um, he and Gretchen are both uh, ill with, and, it, and it's, they tested positive COVID. And I knew what was coming. I could hear it coming. Could you, could you speak in my, I'm a, uh, uh, at church tomorrow? And uh, he said, I'm so sorry for calling. I know you're busy. <laughs> I said, sure, sure, I can do that. No problem. So, um, by the way, let's do this. Uh, I'm sure Dave and Gretchen are listening at home. So can we just lift our hands and say, hi, Dave and Gretchen. Hey, hey, hey. miss you. <laughs> Thanks. You love you too. That's right. Great. Okay. Well, um, I'm not going to. I'm not going to speak about Thessalonians. Um, I I, I, uh, I wasn't prepared for that, but I was prepared for something else. And um, I just want to uh, talk about something that I feel is is timely, and that is uh, uh, division uh, that we are experiencing right now. Have you have you noticed that when you're when you're maybe some of you tuned in to uh, President Biden's uh, inaugural address, and he talked much about unity. But in case you hadn't noticed, we are living in a time of deep division, deep division here in the United States politically. President Biden's inaugural address last Wednesday was largely about unifying our country. What the president has done in the first few days in office, however, has led some Republican politicians to cry foul. <laughs> saying that President Biden has led in a, a very liberal agenda and is ignoring the conservative or Republican agenda. And there's, there's a lot of tension in Washington, D.C. over this issue. Well, President Biden has a tough job. We all recognize that, right? So, hey, listen, let's pray for him. Okay, whether you like him or you don't like him, uh, let's pray for him. Let's, let's fulfill that biblical responsibility and pray for those who are in power and authority over us, okay? Pray faithfully for them for uh, President Biden and, and Vice President uh, Harris. Did you know that there are divisive issues in the church as well? Oh, shock, right? <laughs> yeah, there are. There are significant theological differences. There are differences uh, 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 of practice based on those theological differences. And there are differences of preference or likes. I know of a small Pentecostal church in uh, a small town in South Dakota where I was youth pastor of this church, uh, this other church uh, in town, well, went through a nasty split. And the split was over the color of paint for the walls on the inside of the sanctuary. Lavender won, so off-white people, the off-white proponents, packed their bags and left. And what a shame. What a shame. Um, because, you know, uh, folks, whether we realize it or not, the world is watching. The world is watching the church to see what happens in the church. And so we have to be careful to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, the Scripture says. We don't have to create the unity of the Spirit, but preserve or maintain it. The unity of the Spirit is there because we are... Uh, of one faith, one Lord, one baptism, 
and there is one church, right? One Lord of the church. And so our responsibility is to maintain the unity of the Spirit. In other words, uh, put down your, your, your fisticuffs and your guns and, and love each other. In fact, Jesus said, by this, all men will know that you're my disciples. If you have love one for another, right? You have love for one another. It's hard because, uh, I, I, I've said this when I was a pastor, ministry would be really easy if it weren't for people. <laughs> because people can be difficult. Marshall Shelley wrote a book called Well-Intentioned Dragons. Sometimes people can be well-intentioned dragons, you know, fighting for their own cause, fighting for their perspective, fighting against others in the church. And that's, uh, that's unfortunate, but it's true. Well, uh, what are the substantive issues causing division in the church uh, these days, and has been for some time now, is the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of believers. I believe that the differences are really framed around three questions or issues. Now, you may say it's, it's larger than that, Jim. It's more complex than that. Well, maybe, but I'm of a very simple mind, and I kind of see things simply. Um, I, like to think, I like to think I see things clearly, but I, I sometimes think, well, my, maybe I just see things simply. <laughs> Anyway, this is, this is what I see as the, the three primary issues that cause division around this doctrine of um, and practice of life in the Spirit, the, the, the Spirit-filled life. Is the, here's question number one. Is the initial infilling, a.k.a. baptism, of the Holy Spirit something that happens in the life of every believer at the time of conversion, or is it a subsequent experience or what is sometimes referred to as a second blessing? That's a key question. Is the infilling, the initial infilling or the baptism of the Holy Spirit, does that happen at conversion or is it a second blessing? That's an important question. Another question is, are all the gifts of the Spirit still operative in the church today, or have some ceased to function? It's an important question. Another question is this, the third one is this, is there one manifestation of the infilling of the Spirit that should outweigh or outshine the rest, i.e. speaking in tongues and prophecy, or are all the gifts of the Spirit equal in importance? Another important question to deal with as we approach this subject of the Holy Spirit and the role of the Holy Spirit in the church today. Now this may seem, like I said, as an oversimplification of the issues, but in my mind these three issues are the crux of the division that separates Pentecostals from Evangelicals and Pentecostal from Pentecostal. And these issues separate or divide charismatics from Pentecostals and from evangelicals. If I, and I, when I use that term evangelical, I mean Christian, born-again Christians who are not Pentecostal or charismatic. Okay, so that's how, I'm, that's how I'm using that term. Well, I want to address some of the issues, some of these issues this morning by looking at one text in Acts 19, and then we're going to look at several other biblical texts in the rest of the New Testament. I don't fancy that we could solve all these issues this morning. <laughs> that would take too much time. We'd have to work a lot at it. Um, but I do hope to stir our thinking in an effort to see us base our thinking on the Word of God, not our personal preferences or our dislikes and likes. You may have preferences. You may have likes or dislikes. But we have to base our practice not on those likes or dislikes, not on our personal taste, but on the Word of God. That would be, let me hear an amen there. Amen? Are you with me? We can't base our practice simply on our likes or dislikes. We have to go to the Word of God and say, what does the Word of God say? And develop our practice, our theology, from the Word of God. So, okay, here we go. Ready or not. 
And as you will notice, I don't have the scriptures on a PowerPoint for you, so you're going to have to take your Bible, your phone, or whatever instrument you have for this, with the scriptures and open and read along with me, okay? If you didn't bring your Bible, you just have to listen. So, Acts 19, first seven verses. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? That's an important question, isn't it? They answered, no, <laughs> we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. That's odd. So Paul asked them, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. You might think, oh, Jim, you just stirred the hornet's nest. <laughs> hang on, hang on. We're going to deal with this. We're going to work through it biblically, okay? So don't run away yet. Okay, so what was the message of John the Baptism, John the Baptism, John the Baptist, and what was his baptism about? John's message was one of repentance and preparing for the coming of the Christ or the Messiah, right? Uh, Luke says this, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert, i.e. John the Baptist. He went into all the country around Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill, hill made low, the crooked road shall become straight, the rough way smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. That was Isaiah's prophecy about the role of the forerunner, John, the baptizer, the cousin of Jesus. And then Luke goes on in Luke chapter 3. People were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. John answered them all, I baptize with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the Thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. So who were these 12 disciples? These 12 disciples were disciples of John the Baptist, not of Jesus. They were disciples of John. They had heard John preach, and they responded to John's message of repentance. They repented of their sin. But they hadn't heard the message clearly about Jesus or the Holy Spirit. They'd heard John's message. But when Paul made the message more clear to them about Jesus and the Holy Spirit, these 12 men readily accepted the message from Paul <clears throat> and believed and were baptized, actually rebaptized because they were most likely baptized by John, but now they are baptized by Paul into the name of Jesus. Okay? Are you with me? After they were baptized, Paul laid his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came on, or upon them. The resulting sign of the infilling of the Holy Spirit was that these men began speaking in tongues and prophesying. This was similar to the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, except that in the initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the accompanying sign was only speaking in tongues and not prophecy. 
If you have read the book of Acts recently, you may recall, recall the very similar thing that happened to the Roman centurion Cornelius and his family when they put their faith in Jesus. This is from Acts 10. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. <laughs> for they had heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. A Roman centurion and his family and friends. The story of what happened in Ephesus in Acts 19, the story of what happened in Caesarea to Cornelius in his fam and his family in Acts 10, and what happened in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, all stand as signposts of the activity of the Holy Spirit showing the beginning of the church age. Because the, Jesus initiated the kingdom and the church age, and when the Holy Spirit came, whom Jesus said would come, that initiated the birth of what we call the church, the ecclesia, the called out community, the community of Christ. And my favorite verse about, this, about the Holy Spirit and the role of the Holy Spirit comes from Acts chapter 1, verse 8. There, the disciples are asking, uh, what are the signs of the end of time? What happens at the end of time? Jesus said, never mind that. That's the Jim Black version. <laughs> never mind that. What's important is this. After that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall have power to be my witnesses. That's important. We're going into a new age here, Jesus is saying, basically. We're going into a new age, and you're going to need power to do what you need to do in the coming days. I'm going back to be with my father. But don't worry, because I'm going to send another to be with you, and he will be in you, and he will give you the power to be my witnesses. Well, to understand the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church, you really have to study 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, Romans 12, and other texts from the epistles where Paul and others deal with the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Because you see, uh, Dr. Luke was not doing uh, teaching in the book of Acts. That wasn't the purpose of the book of Acts. The book of Acts is what we call in, uh, in, in, in literature... It was, it was historical narrative. So Dr. Luke was simply recording what happened. He wasn't making any theological assumptions or, or trying to teach theology in any of it. He was just recording what happened. Okay, He was, he was witnessing and, and getting, gathering information for his, then, for, his, for, his, for his friend Theophilus. There we go. For his friend Theophilus, gathering information and in, from eyewitnesses and from his own witness and telling people what happened in those days. So if you want to study the theology of this, you have to read Paul. Especially 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14, Romans chapter 12. And you'll get a better understanding of the theology of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. Because Paul does a lot of teaching in those chapters. For example, 1 Corinthians 12, 29 and 30 says all this. Are all apostles? Is everybody in the church, every single last person, an apostle? What's the obvious answer? No. Okay, you're with me. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Do all work miracles? Same answer. No. Do all have gifts of healing? No. Do all speak in tongues? No. Do all interpret tongues? No. So, if we say that the key sign of the infilling of the Holy Spirit is tongues, then we have a problem with Paul's theology. Now, you may argue with me that there's initial sign that goes away, whatever. I'll leave that to you, and I would love to discuss that with you privately, but we don't have time to do, to do that this morning. All, to, all this to say, 
from Paul's theology in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that the signs differ. The sign gifts differ. And not everybody, ha- not everybody has one gift. We all have different gifts as the Spirit gave them. That's from, from Paul in 1 Corinthians 12. Okay, so the church in Corinth had become confused about this matter of the charismata, or spiritual gifts, and, and about the exercise of those gifts. So the exercise of the gifts became a sort of competition in the church. I have this gift, so I'm better than you. Oh, yeah? Yeah, well, I have this gift, so I'm actually better than you. Oh, yeah, want to fight about it? Come on, put up your dukes. No, come on. The Holy Spirit wasn't doing that. People were doing that. So the obvious answer to each of these questions is no. We don't all have the same gift or gifts. We have what I like to refer to as a gift mix. God gives us not one gift, but I think multiple gifts, because the gifts are used, they're given to us by God, given to us for the building up of the whole body of Christ, and God uses your personality, your education, your experience, and the gifts that he has sovereignly given you because you're important in the body of Christ. We need you. We need you to be a part of the body of Christ. We need your gifts. We need the talents. We need what God has done in you to, be, uh, to complete us. Right? So, okay, um, in the next five minutes, <laughs> let's look at the rest of the New Testament. <laughs> Dream on, brother. Give me a little extra time, okay? Um, I'll take 10 or 15, maybe. Um, what is the teaching about the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer? Consider what the Bible teaches us uh, what the Bible teaches us about the Holy Spirit, who, when he has come, it will, be our, it will be our responsibility and our response to the Holy Spirit that is very important. I tried, in this study, I tried to isolate the Holy Spirit's role from our response. I tried hard to do that, and I found it's very difficult. It's like asking, which came first, the chicken or the egg? I don't know, I wasn't there. <laughs> I look old, but I'm not that old. Uh, you know, it's a hard question to, a- to answer. You know, uh, uh, which, which part is the Holy Spirit? Which part is our response to the Holy Spirit? And as, as, I, as, I, as I point these scriptures out to you, you're going to see how difficult that is. Okay, But there are some scriptures that talk about our responsibility and our response to the Holy Spirit. Okay. Let's start with John, and if, you have, if you're taking notes, here we go. John 14, and John does a lot of teaching about the Holy Spirit. John 14, verses 15 to 18. If you love me, you will obey my commandments, Jesus said, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor. <laughs> That's a really interesting word in the Greek language. It's parakletos, which means someone who comes alongside of you. Someone who comes close to you to enable you to walk the path, <laughs> to walk the Jesus path, the parakletos. I will send uh, uh, you another counselor, another parakletos, to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. The parakletos, the comforter, the counselor, he is the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know, you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Aren't you grateful for the Holy Spirit who is not only with us, but in us? Guess what, friends? You and I would fail miserably every day if we tried to live this Christian life by the best energy of the flesh. <laughs> if I tried with all my strength to walk this Christian path, to, do, to, to live like Jesus lived, to be like Jesus in the best energy of Jim's abilities, I would fail every time. Praise God, he doesn't require us to do that. He requires us to allow the Spirit of God to do that. 
the spirit of truth, the, the coming alongside one to do that. Okay, I could preach on every one of these verses. How many of you are interested in watching the football game this afternoon at 2 o'clock? Shoot, I was hoping nobody was. I'm just kidding. We're not going to stay here until 2 o'clock. John 14, 25 and 27. Jesus is speaking again. This is all Jesus, you know. So it's kind of important to hear, right? Because Jesus knew what he's talking about, right? Pretty much. We, we assume Jesus knew what he's talking about. All this I have spoken while still with you, Jesus said. But the counselor, the coming alongside one, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. He will teach you all things or remind you of the things I said to you. Again, John 15, 26 and 27. When the, when the counselor comes, the parakletos, the coming alongside one, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. The Spirit will testify about me. So the Spirit of God gives us the ability and prompting to testify about Jesus. John 16, verses 7 and 9. Unless I go away, Jesus says, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. It, it kind of doesn't set well with me when I hear somebody say, I led somebody to Jesus. No, you didn't. You testified of your faith. You shared the gospel with them. But you didn't lead them to Jesus. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. Amen? That's the role of the Holy Spirit. He's got to bring the conviction. He's got to bring that certainty. It's the role of the Holy Spirit working in you. You're a witness. You and I are witnesses. But it's got to be the role of the Holy Spirit to take that witness and and, and allow it to go into the heart of your friend and, and, and bring them to that place where they see the light and they hate the darkness and they love the light and they're, and they're tired of their sinfulness and they want Jesus. That's where I was at, at age 17. I wanted Jesus so badly. I was sitting in a church like, a meeting like this one evening. It was October 3rd, 1976. And, the, and I don't remember a word the missionary said. But I remember afterwards, the pastor said, if you have to leave, leave. If you don't have to leave, just sit where you are. Turn to the person next to you and say, can I pray with you about something? I was sitting there shaking. I just wanted Jesus so bad, so badly. And the, 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 the young lady next to me turned to me and said, Jim, what can I pray with you about? And I said, I need Jesus! <laughs> I need Jesus! She prayed with me. And I, I received Jesus, and my life changed. My life changed. The Holy Spirit convicting me of that need for repentance, and I was tired of my sin. I was sick of it. I was so sick of it. And I knew that only Jesus could make that change in my life. <sighs> First Corinthians twelve eleven. To each one. All y'all, as they say in the South, to all y'all, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11. The manifestation of the Spirit is given for, for the common good of, of the whole body. That's why the gifts are given. Uh, Galatians 5, 22, 24. But the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit or, or evidence of the Spirit in a person's life is love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Basically, this is, this is, what, this is how I see it. Um, the Holy Spirit changes our character. He changes who we are. 
And that's the fruit of the Spirit. That's the evidence of the Spirit. He changes who we are to make us more like Jesus. You know? So, uh, when we're, before, we, before we get uh, converted and regenerated, we're, we're just walking in the flesh. You know, we do what we want to do. <laughs> Brokenness, barrenness, unforgiveness, whatever. You know, we're, we're walking in the flesh. But then when we come to know Jesus and the Spirit of God comes into us, we become different. Can you believe this? I was the shyest kid in the whole school in June, through junior high and high school. You would never see me walking up on a platform like this. Not in my wildest dreams. I wanted to be in forestry because I could go in the woods and I didn't have to talk to trees. <laughs> and they didn't talk to me and I was just fine with that. But God has done something in my life. He's changed me. Ask my wife. She'll tell you. I'm a different person than I was back then. And you're different. If you've come to know Jesus, if the Spirit of God has come into you, you're different. You've changed. You like to worship. <laughs> you like God's Word. You like to pray. It might be work sometimes, but you know you need to pray and you like to pray. That's different, isn't it? Okay, so we don't have much time to go into the, you know, what our responsibility part is, but let, let me just point out one or two. Like Galatians 5, 16 to 18. So I say, live or walk by the Spirit. There's our responsibility. Live or walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature, for the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. So if you're led by the Spirit, you will be, you will be seeing this transformation of your character to be more and more like Jesus. Or Galatians 5.25, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. In other words, let, allow Him to lead and, and be, be sensitive to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Be sensitive to the prompting of God's Spirit. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. Paul says in Romans 8, but if the Spirit, uh, if, if by the Spirit you put to death the, mis the misdeeds, by the, uh, uh, misdeeds of the body. So by the Spirit, we, we say no to sin. And God's Spirit is helping us to do that. Saying no to sin. And saying yes to righteousness. And then when we mess it up, when we, in that moment, we say yes to sin and no to righteousness, the Spirit of God convicts us, helps us to realize we did wrong, and then what do we do? We run. Not away from the cross, but to the cross. We run and say, Jesus, I blew it. I was walking in the flesh in that, in that moment. I blew it. That was not of you. That was not of faith. That was not righteous. I did the wrong thing. I confess it. I forsake that. Thank you, Jesus, for your forgiveness. We walk on. Amen? Because, hey, um, I've gotten to know a few of you. Not many, but a few of you. And I know that you, like me, have a tendency to be sinful people. And so do I. But, since the Holy Spirit has come into us, He's helping us to be different. To be more like Jesus. And when we mess it up, when we sin, in other words, we figured out what to do with it. <laughs> We figured out where to go. We go to the cross. We go to the cross. Say, Jesus, that blood you shed, that was for me. That was for me. That beating you took, that was for me. Jesus, you're, you, you hung on the cross for me in my place. And now I'm forgiven. I stand forgiven. So don't beat yourself up when you mess up. You're going to mess up from time to time. Go to Jesus, get it right, confess it, forsake it, and move on. You can't stop a bird from flying over your head. 
but you can stop him from building a nest in your hair. Right? Right? You get that? You can't stop those sinful thoughts from coming by once in a while, but they don't have to take root in your soul. Deal with them quickly. Okay. Um, I have... I have weeded through a bunch of stuff because I know we, we, we'll come back to this another time, maybe. <laughs> um, Millard Erickson, in his Christian theology, has some very sa- sound summary of the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of believers and our responsibility to him. Erickson says this, God, number one, God sovereignly gives spiritual gifts to believers as he deems best, right? I've said that already. Secondly, if God chooses to give us a gift, he'll do it whether we seek it or not. Thirdly, the purpose of spiritual gifts is to accomplish God's will and advance his kingdom. Accomplish God's will and advance his kingdom. Fourthly, we are, <clears throat> we are commanded to continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 Be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And there are some signs that Paul talks about that in Ephesians 5, 18 and following. Be filled with this, be being filled with the Spirit. It is appropriate, number 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 five, it is appropriate to pray to the Holy Spirit. Number six. When that happens, writes Erickson, our lives will manifest whatever gifts God intends for us to have, along with the fruit and acts of empowering that he wishes to display through us. And so, and I land here, and so, yield yourself fully to God's Holy Spirit to continually, continually fill you. Allow the Holy Spirit to empower you to be transformed. To be more like Jesus. Enjoy the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit as he clarifies and convinces you that you are indeed God's dear child. Living the wonderful, spirit-filled life is not exclusively for Christian superstars. It is for all of us. Living the wonderful, spirit-filled life is for all of us. It's the norm, not the exception. Because we can't do this. We can't live out this Christian life apart from Him, apart from His Spirit in us, working in us and working through us. So whether you're here in person today or whether you're at home listening in, I invite you to to pray like, like my wife and I do almost every day. Lord, I consecrate to you my mind, emotions, and will, my body, soul, and spirit, I consecrate all that I am and have to you. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill me anew, afresh, because I know I need you. I consecrate my mind, emotions, and will, my body, soul, and spirit, to you. So come and fill me anew, fill me afresh, because I know I need you. Just that simple. It's not complex. It's pretty simple. Would you pray with me as we close? Father, we are so grateful for the cross, for Jesus' death, in our place and on our behalf. We're so grateful for the cross. We're so grateful for the Holy Spirit, whom Jesus, you sent. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you came. 
Gracious Spirit of God, come and fill us anew, fill us afresh. Transform us, change us to be more like Jesus. Empower us to be bold witnesses, to testify about Jesus. Gracious God, thank you so much. Father, that you sent Jesus. Jesus, that you sent the Holy Spirit. And now we are the sent ones, empowered by the Holy Spirit to be light and salt, to be witnesses of this great and wonderful transformation called grace, enabled by the Holy Spirit, provided through the sacrifice of Jesus. Lord, we're so grateful. We're so grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, gracious Holy Spirit. Amen.